Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, uh, and I'm, I'm very surprised to find uh, such a big audience here and also such a big screen. I think I've never seen uh, my work uh, as big projected as this. Um, yeah, so um, let me um, start by, I, I want to talk a little bit about what we do today, which is not, we, we do a lot of projects and we've always been very, very active and we see more and more our work becoming mixed use, mixed everything, uh, all over the place, many different cultures, many different scales, many different um, typologies of work, and um, this is something that, that we find extremely interesting, extremely challenging, and also we learn uh, so much from it, and we, we by doing one thing, for instance, a, um, uh, a facade, um, yeah, we learn um, f from, uh, from that something sometimes completely different that we can apply to a different scale, to a different way of working, and this is something that we feel more and more, um, it's, it's, it's a question of our time is then how, how, um, how do we share? things like that and that is what we've been really most interested in in the last three years so mm, just a little bit of a quick history um, in uh, quantified uh, so in figures what what we have been doing and where so what what uh, what is shaping the practice and um, as I said all all the different types of projects that, that we have been doing and that we still uh, are after because we've always uh, refused to become specialist in something or to, to become pigeonholed because we want to be we want to be flexible and find new challenges. So as we developed and you know we first of course starting out even our name was Van Berkel and Bos uh, Architecture Bureau. So architecture we saw still very much as central to the practice. So, and what is architecture? Well, it, it is a building, of course. That that is how how we also quite conventionally started out thinking with architecture central. Um, but the but urban planning and urban design sort of in, in the sort of overlap between architecture maybe and urban planning also became very quickly a, a part of our practice. And then also smaller things, uh, exhibition, uh, design pavilions, interiors, the recent interior we did for a house in the Netherlands which was um, uh, photographed a few months ago. And then even the at the smaller product product uh, chairs and uh, for the last biennale even uh, help uh, heavens help us we never thought we would do it a pair of shoes but there you go so all these um, all these different fields came up more and more and and grabbed our interest and especially the overlaps between these different fields turned out to be really fascinating to us so some some uh, part of our of our thinking is now that a lot of innovation a lot of knowledge is actually found in all the overlaps and then so the real over uh, the real um, point of interest maybe is in the overlaps of all the overlaps what is happening there and that is where our um, where we tried to first, when we when, because knowledge is such a vast field, when you, so when we had to question uh, what exactly do we mean, so that is where we started out looking where we think that we thought that we could um, identify and locate a specific new uh, unique knowledge that we would be uh, able to develop and to share. Um, and 
when you think also uh, of in the past how knowledge was uh, developed in in, uh, in in sort of interdisciplinary conditions this is a, a famous um, uh, Vienna cafe where all different kinds of scientists and artists and authors would meet and at a very fertile ground for innovation for ground breaking thought so this uh, interdisciplinary platforms for meeting and exchanging ideas are a sort of um, natural um, occurrence and something that people naturally seek and, and have always sought to um, uh, yeah, to, to innovate and to uh, push their experiments and their thoughts further. But of course, uh, not for nothing is this um, lecture also under the uh, title of uh, women in architecture. There were not many women present at uh, these meetings and still maybe there are not so many women uh, present in uh, in our uh, discipline these uh, these are um, statistic a statistic that um, yeah has been um, uh, uh, found by a friend of mine uh, Caroline James and she is the woman who is actually behind the campaign to um, give the woman whose picture we just saw, uh, Denise called Brown, um, also the Pritzker Prize, because you know, as you know, she had a lifelong uh, collaboration with um, Robert Venturi, but only he was honored, and um, that was very um, uh, emblematic of a situation, maybe of continued invisibility of women in architecture which has now been redressed. And um, so the issue of, of, of women maybe still lagging behind a little bit in our profession has been, I think, put for, forward again, put back on the table, but this time in a very uh, positive way. Um, so we are, we are not um, the... Um, uh, so much uh, here to um, maybe... Um, complain but more to celebrate the women that that we can find and to find optimistic signs this other um, uh, um, diagram was I was put to my attention by uh, one of my partners in US studio Astrid Bieber and um, it's so an, another uh, very hopeful sign for the future in the sense that apparently um, most uh, it, when you work for a uh, renowned architect, let's say it says maybe um, hey, you can interpret these images, you have a much better chance of becoming a successful uh, architect yourself or study with uh, an architect of name, it really put your chances forward. And so mm, the more probably also women come in that position, they will be able to uh, exert that effect of um, uh, into um, also f uh, to them and uh, and then this uh, image of this uh, rather uh, yeah uh, solid and uh, um, gentleman with his tie might uh, get updated. So another statistic about the um, yeah the the. the lack of presence of um, women in uh, architecture or the need for, for, for women to catch up. And um, that also um, yeah, meant that le I wanted to take an honest look at what was happening in our own studio. And um, in fact, we are rather um, typical of today's practice in that um, the um, yeah about a third of the um, uh, total staff and slightly less when it really concerns architects uh, are women but then again um, very um, hopeful and actually 
much against um, the previous image, which shows that the, the, the um, scarcity of women gets in fact worse more uh, when you go to the top. In fact, in uh, UN Studio, this is um, another trend. We are uh, we have actually higher uh, representation uh, than uh, at, at the top levels than when it go comes to, uh, to the ju more junior levels. But um, we should think about uh, not only, I think, women, uh, we should think about and uh, more about equality in general. And um, this and take uh, that as, as something to uh, work towards and then not see it only as a polarized uh, debate, but as, as a very um, rich debate about how can we um, organize ourselves uh, to uh, promote more equality. Um, and another way I thought of um, looking at it is that, in fact, there are um, what can be the role of the client in that. And this project, the Erasmus Bridge, was the um, project that started out our practice. As a very, very young and inexperienced architect, we were, uh, through a fluke, put in the lucky position that we were uh, selected to design this, oh, sorry, uh, pressing the wrong button, this bridge. And this was the powerful figure behind that. This was the uh, city planner of Rotterdam at that time. So the role of, of the client is um, also an impor important one. And I think also that, um, that when there are more women in that position, that too will be um, very helpful. And in fact, in the project that we are Mm, currently working on in, in China, that is also an enormous uh, project. Again, the uh, client is, uh, is this woman, a uh, very, very strong uh, supporter of architecture, both uh, powerful, not afraid to um, use their uh, that had their skills, their expertise, their their voice, and um, extremely um, knowledgeable as well. <coughs> so um, I started out by saying that we really believed um, the last few years that um, what you could see as is a sort of a side product of architecture that you gain knowledge from it uh, and architecture is always usually more focused on the product on what you what you produce on the project itself but as you do it you you gain a lot of knowledge and where does that knowledge end up it it's sort of is very fleeting it's it stays in, in a, uh, only in the heads of the team members as long as the project is alive normally and then it dissipates. So this is, um, whereas in fact there, there's, there's so much of value there and sometimes projects now are, uh, are very fleeting and so maybe the knowledge is actually even more valuable than projects. And um, with the, that in mind we were yeah, looking to investigate how we could um, turn ourselves into a uh, into a knowledge practice, having already once made the transition into this network practice, as I said, instigated by this project. Um, when we were uh, commissioned with this project, um, as, as I said, we were a very small practice and um, we had only been in practice for about a year and a half. So we also knew nothing even. And, and we had to work together with 200 engineers and all sorts of heavy experts. So we then learned that, you know, the network uh, is very much uh, important, you know, it, it's not the architect is not at all the designer whose vision uh, is um, put put down on, in drawings and then can be um, 
um, had, had can then be communicated simply and, and is taken over uh, seamlessly by anyone else. No, in fact, it's, it's very much a process and that only much later I read about has been theorized extensively by uh, Bruno Latour and he, um, there he also rewrites about the actor network where it is um, an, 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 a, the actor is someone who is uh, willing and able to um, make change and the uh, and 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 that that he can only do by enrolling all the other actors so by convincing other people to go along with you all the time so this we learned early on was actually maybe the most important defining role of the architect to build a strong network that you keep active all the time and where you um, yeah where where you have where you enroll other strong actors in who are willing to su to support your vision and who you also have to listen to, of course. So, and then after that project was completed, we straight away were engaged on another project. And this project we are now only opening next month. So that took nearly, um, Actually, nearly. It is, so it said here that it was going to be opened in 2014. It is yet another delay. So nearly 20 years uh, working on this project continuously with so many setbacks. So again, so many parties, so many changes of policies, uh, budgets uh, slashed, people taken off the project. Incredibly. Um, uh, yeah, changeable environment in which to. Yeah, it is therefore again more important than ever to continuously rebuild the network as well, because the network can is, is a very unstable thing, in fact. So from uh, have, f so from do learning from those projects, we try to apply those those findings to our own organization and we would try to think about what we were doing and what the roles were of a designer of you know of a project man manager an advisor what f even the finance people mm, people having to do with all the certificates that you need to be able to to qualify for jobs what these how these people would all uh, work together in, in, in this dynamic, continuously changing field. And then, um, as we uh, were, uh, and, and, and as we um, progressed through time and realized that we were also producing along the way a lot of knowledge along, along the design that we were producing, we began to um, think about how can we um, uh, categorize that knowledge and what is the knowledge that we really after what is really interesting so I showed in that first series of diagrams these overlapping circles and what that, that real innovation is happening there and so we in the end um, captured that into four different platforms one to do with all the um, yeah, techniques, uh, had the, the contemporary tools of architecture, the smart parameters. One also to do with organization, how do you really in the end put together that building, that um, urban plan, often a mixed use situation on multiple ground levels with many, many different um, functions in it. Oops. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Then materials, um, looking always for newer materials, more sustainable, sm uh, smart ways to put them together, and then a sort of overlapping thing, sustainability, which we want to see as something that, that, that architecture has to give its own response to, not just um, apply technologies of others. So internally we um, we began by intensifying our um, debates internally in on um, 
geared on, on that knowledge, on those forms of knowledge. And we did that in, in the forms of um, debates and internal conferences that are uh, still going on, all kinds of workshops that we have internally, but also uh, um, in the form of projects. They are, they, in the projects we develop that knowledge, so it, has, it is in the end one thing. It's an it's an, an integral system, but it has, um, yeah, it it has. Uh, let's say here is where certain um, so that knowledge is then um, sort of redigested and um, put in in other words, media, and so on. And and he, here is where it is first in a seminal form um, created. So here are some. Um, examples of what of what it actually entails. What are we actually doing then? Um, it, it, some of this is, is training things, some to do with um, um, uh, with with um, computer programs. Some are to do with uh, research together with maybe some academic bodies, uh, projects as well. Some some. Um, there's a little bit of a system trying uh, to develop in the Netherlands and in Europe where um, academies and um, and laboratories, scientific institutions and uh, design practices try to work together in projects. So, um, you, s summing up, this is, I think, how you could define the US studio of today. We and have always been very lucky uh, with our opportunities, but we've always also grabbed the opportunities that presented themselves. And we've always had this very questioning attitude. So for um, uh, the rest of the uh, lecture after this, I want to also take you through some of those questions we are asking ourselves. But first, again, uh, a sort of honest reflection. I al always try to use also opportunities like these to learn a bit more myself about what 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 is what are are we doing and how do you see that and what you think about it. So um, I, I want to try to be upfront and say who is you in studio and. Um, we are, of course, a Dutch practice who came up at a time when uh, Dutch practices, a lot of Dutch practices were coming up and they were labeled together under the term Super Dutch, which was a term that was um, uh, coined by a Dutch uh, architectural critic, Bart Lootsma, and he wrote a book about that. And it was at a time when um, there was a lot of uh, support uh, for the younger emerging practices, a lot of political support, and also um, this was um, uh, then underscored by also private support. So both um, municipalities, uh, government institutions would commission young architects with little or no experience and would be also uh, subsidized to exhibit, to publish, and so on. And um, that led to a successful wave of Dutch practices, which is still continuing today. And of course, in, in, a, in a way, when, that, when you are put uh, together in a group and, and in a label like that, uh, you resist it, I, I feel not completely comfortable with it, um, I think, as, as, as it's very natural. But um, when I think, for instance, of a situation just before, a little, few years before Dutch architecture became so strong, um, it had happened to Spanish architects. And there, too, I think it is fair to say that the whole revival of Barcelona and institutional and uh, monetary support of young practices in that revival actually played a strong, strong role in um, 
yeah, making Spanish architecture very strong. So to be fair, I do think that this is something that made Dutch architecture very strong. And um, on the other hand, there's Dutch um, uh, planning maybe, Dutch urban design and also architecture has quite a strong history of its own also. Um, had, I have here an, um, an uh, image of the uh, dike that was made when, the, when part of the sea was um, um, turned into an inside lake in the Netherlands, so gaining a lot of land, the pulverization, reclaimed land is a strong history. Um, but even in, in Amsterdam, the 17th century, the circle of canals, sort of big, um, big, big visions, big designs are also in the DNA of Dutch architecture. And then there's also a strong history of social thinking that architecture, uh, fundamentally, each architect is trained to feel that you must make a contribution to a better future. And that, that's still something, even if we don't uh, succeed, we, there's still something that is very deeply ingrained in the Dutch architect. And then finally also, what I said, that, that network intelligence is also something that is very deeply inherent in a, in a Dutch tradition and that you also see in our work. And then also what is very specific of our work is this combination of both that interest in the network uh, and then what is a network? We, we studied that also early on and understanding that, you know, that there's different types of network and the distributed network where all the connections are optimized and really all brought into contact with each other <coughs> is actually the best, the most effective and, and the best model. But um, besides, so besides that interest in the network and in lines and connecting lines, there was there's also been a fascination always in uh, in us with with the object itself, with the object of architecture and what you are producing. And so when we wrote um, a sort of manifesto for UN Studio, we chose this. Uh, image as its emblem and it is a very uh, scary image in on the one hand and it, it's it's a very strange image it is a, a sort of a, a strange combination of various animals together and um, but to to us that represented also that the relational approach that we like to uh, to emphasize where we where we see the object as something that is seamless, intriguing, innovative, uh, has a power of its own. So um, this question attitude, I want to also follow through uh, with this evening and take you uh, now through uh, some of the questions that, that we would be asking ourselves. And um, for instance, it is um, uh, relating to that previous image with our interest both in network and object, a question would be how do we make spaces of flow like a bridge station, uh, spaces where that are all about mobility in this time of uh, increased uh, mobility and accessibility, but also that spaces that are also places that have a real place identity. Uh, I, I am myself an, um, an, uh, an uh, art, art historian first and an uh, urban planner second. So my uh, interest in architecture has always been uh, quite analytical. And um, someone who, who I've been, I, I read also more, uh, more um, works from, uh, from, from urban, urbanists than from architects, I suppose. And someone who, who has al also um, written about the spaces of flow is, is um, a, um, uh, an urban planner in uh, Britain and, and he also holds that architects have not really yet 
found um, the, the answer to what makes a space flow very different. Um, the, uh, and when you look at a lot of airports and railway stations, they are actually still uh, a, a box with a very clearly defined inside and outside. And um, that, for us, that question of um, flowing and, and seeing, uh, yeah, having not a box, but, you know, a real um, architecture of flow was um, very early on uh, something that we were looking for. This is an older project, the Möbius House, and it is completely uh, constructed on the basis of yeah, moving through the house in a sort of 24 hour uh, pattern of living where you sometimes as as the as the the person living in the house you're in your own space sometimes you meet maybe the other and um, and and actually we we are very interested in how people move through space um, not just how they um, yeah how, how they are in a s statically present in a space so this project too I already mentioned it, that very long, long, long project in uh, of the station in uh, Arnhem. Here too, there is a diagram that, that connects the flows very much to um, specific mm -hmm. nodes and, and uh, specific happenings. So I quickly want to take you through um, through this, these three sort of key projects and or, or just quickly show you the actually this one image of these key projects that are all showing you um, architecture as very largely a space of flow and it being um, very much a sort of infrastructural architecture this project uh, that I just showed you uh, the Mercedes-Benz Museum in uh, Germany is also um, uh, this image, what I show here, shows you also that space of flow is not uh, so easy to achieve and often requires a lot of technology. For instance, this is a the this strange image is shows you the technology that actually makes the space of flow of this museum possible, because it in order to have this um, atrium where you can move through freely and a open building that is very um, yeah that, that that allows that flow we needed to um, uh, yeah this, this almost wasn't possible because you normally need for um, uh, you, you for the fire regulations you need to close off an atrium you cannot have it completely open you have to have all sorts of compartments and um, uh, that that can be closed in case of fire, and the real uh, danger of a fire is is the smoke. This um, is a sort of tornado that can come out of the roof in case of a fire and suck out all the smoke. Um, this shows this uh, being tested in the museum, and because of that, um, this 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 completely open uh, construction is possible where you um, go to the you go to the top of the museum with a uh, lift an elevator and then you wander down th through one uh, of two possible paths and continuously along the way you are surrounded by the space you have the space um, yeah in front of you behind uh, diagonally to the sides uh, it is a, is an openness that architecture does not uh, often uh, offer and um, that can also lead to surprises and um, and, um, and 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 that, that goes like here from the outside of the building goes into the inside and and so this um, interest in, in outside, inside condition uh, is very much also uh, characteristic of our work. And here we s you see all the um, experimental models we did during the competition phase that, that explore that, that explore that continuous flow 
in different ways. How how is it made possible? How exactly do you relate these these overlapping floors to each other? It is because it's not simply stacked floor levels. The floors fuse one into the other. So the flow you can see in a plan section and uh, it really is continuous three-dimensionally. Here we can see also the uh, um, uh, the um, effect that it has on the uh, facade. So the facade is completely the effect of what happens on the inside. And here this image shows um, yeah, the um, how these three these three uh, clover leaves are uh, situated um, on different uh, levels um, <coughs> vertically, and all this makes it possible, of course, at the end for for the visitor to have an exciting experience to see cars from all sorts of unusual angles here sort of stuck to the ceiling but also here on elevations and um, that is what it is about and to 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 make that possible to um, we develop had to develop also this huge model to um, test out how the, how the exhibition could be constructed with different with the cars being put on the platforms here but also to show to the to the client how it worked because it was it was so complex that it was almost impossible to understand it um, and and these um, special moments where these different floors really flow into each other also had to be tested out on the site in a in a model so these um, yeah that, that was an uh, important part of it um, another question, um, how do we reconcile the large-scale urban developments that we often see today? We see buildings have become so big, um, the project I just showed you in China um, is, is nearly uh, 500,000 square meters, it's a, the size of a, of a neighborhood. How do we reconcile that with with the individual experience, as I just said, in the Mercedes-Benz, ultimately it is, of course, how you, as for, as an individual, experience the building, what it does to uh, with you. And um, so that is also a question. It's a questioning attitude, a question that comes back to us and that in informs what we do. So we don't really think so much as design in terms of solution, but far more in terms of question. So how do we do that? For instance, this massive project, as I said, uh, so uh, interesting woman, uh, supporter client, uh, a wonderful location in a city about a hundred uh, miles outside of Shanghai, Hangzhou, and it's two enormous towers, but we have placed them on this pedestal that, that is very open, we've made that very open with lots of openings there and we have made these towers turn away from each other so there is some uh, individuality in that uh, turning away from each other and some dynamic we, we have to, it's not completely finished yet so we have to see how it's going to work um, and you know, practically, these these you get different views that respond to different parts of the city. But really, it is also an, an both an urban gesture and also something that um, within the the context of the city will hopefully provide uh, a, some visual some some visual <coughs> excitement. And here we, uh, yeah, we see that happening. So that 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 twisting moment is also something to uh, that can capture the eye, and um, that that can, uh, um, yeah, it, it could give a sort of uh, visual uh, vibrancy also to the city. 
Um, okay, another another question. When you had space again, maybe to the spaces of flow, uh, they when you now you uh, when you in uh, come into a city, it is often through a space of flow. You have these you have tunnels, and uh, you you have. Um, uh, that urban platform in China I just showed you with these openings um, so the cuts the cuts in the landscape and the cuts in the uh, in the fabric that they they are also uh, there's an, a possible answer to the question here for us and we find them really interesting and uh, if you look through the history of uh, the work of UN studio you will find uh, those um, entrances uh, and those cuts in the landscape everywhere. This is the first part of that Arnhem uh, station. That uh, This was the first part that was built of all the 19 years that we've been working on for a long time. This was the only part that was realized. It's a little tunnel that um, goes through the side and then halfway in leads people into the uh, underground parking. The parking has these um, uh, cuts also in it that lead, that allow the daylight to go directly to the deepest level. Mm. Again, an, uh, a parking garage is also a form of an entrance to many situations now. And then these are the um, the, the railway platforms that have just been realized. And uh, here we see the total project um, together and under construction. This photo is already a couple of uh, months old. It's now much further ahead. And here too we see these big cuts. So this is the central hall where the where you um, uh, as a train passenger come in and you buy your ticket and you go to your platform and that hall is ho all held together um, in a sort of a big roof and here is the um, uh, central column that uh, yeah embraces the entire construction um, yeah it, it's I hear someone laughing it looks maybe a little bit chaotic and uh, but it's um, uh, it, it's already a lot uh, tidied up now. So again, um, yeah, giving you an idea of the um, of of the um, of of a new sort of space of flow, which where inside and outside are uh, yeah are more um, connected to each other in a more complex loop situation and you go from one to the other and you don't it's not as if you you um, step out of head normally you, you arrive in a railway station maybe it's a beautiful monumental building you step out you're in the rain and you go to the bus sh shelter and suddenly you are a second class passenger again so we are trying to uh, integrate those qualities far more. Uh, here we see it is incredibly compact um, uh, it's, um, station with offices integrated with these um, uh, uh, these um, platforms, and it is in fact um, so compact that it is four times as much program on this location um, as it used to have. So it is, besides um, being a new station, it is also an, a sort of an exercise in densification. And this this was the this parking garage, that was the second part of the project that was uh, completed. And so has luckily already been uh, in use for a long time. And um, again, uh, showing showing you, um, I hope, what um, yeah that also for us with this uh, concept of relating um, um, yeah a relational approach also means that you can achieve a higher quality in in the, in this sense a relational approach means for instance that we don't have columns 
because we have put the columns in the walls. And so we use the, the space uh, and, and the way you move through the space, we combine that with the structural system. So that is really what I mean by a relational system, that we don't see architecture as consisting of all these separate things, but we try to bring them together as much as possible, uh, believing that we can uh, generate much higher quality that way. And, and um, uh, for instance, uh, have this, this openness also creates a sense of, of both quality, but also safety. There are no dark corners. Uh, it's not, you know, not a, not a dangerous uh, place as many parking garages are. And also, the same station um, that that continues outside the parking garage when you go to your train or come back. Again, it's all transparent, and because of the light, you sort of sense and can see where you go uh, much more naturally and quickly. You don't have you be. Of course, there are signs still there, but not so many signs uh, that you you know you get confused. It's sort of a, 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 a natural way of uh, flow that the architecture helps you to find using also light as you know an important classical ingredient of architecture to help with that and uh, yeah now an, um, another um, uh, yeah another question how can we improve public city life and connectivity for everyone so i uh, yeah equality and and the social awareness that is so ingrained in maybe architecture in general or especially maybe the 20th century uh, has uh, architecture was very much in the function of emancipation and uh, that um, heritage is very strong still in architecture mm, this project uh, we've been working on now for the last three or four years and it is a, a public uh, metro network in um, Qatar a city which um, has no public transport yet it's an also a city that has grown incredibly fast in the last 20 years or so from a tiny uh, fishing village that it was uh, even in the 1960s it is now a real uh, yeah city with a sort of metropolitan area and here these two questions of flow and network but also identity um, um, come very closely together and for this uh, project we developed an um, a, also again a very integral approach where we thought about both uh, about the identities of the different of the whole network the whole metro network that we're creating of the different uh, lines that we were also uh, making because there are four different lines going to four different areas of the city then of the stations themselves of which there are several different types Mm, and uh, we tried because it's, we tried to do this with Qatar on a tight budget in an incredibly tight ti uh, time frame. We try to work with a modular system that can be um, applied by many, many different building firms and many different architects. So we have actually only designed for them a sort of an, uh, what they call a brand manual that is to say we we, we, um, we have designed a sort of look and feel of what their station should be uh, should become like uh, this is uh, a very big uh, station some are just a little more than shelters and uh, this can be uh, yeah as I said carried out by different firms and we have um, yeah worked out um, for that the um, uh, yeah even little um, uh, scripts that that people can apply and and uh, um, correction measures and so on well as I said the um, yeah the network as a whole the line and the stations each um, try to embody an own identity and with that we 
um, want to respond to very much to local materials, ceramic tiles, um, and the uh, vaults are also or identified by us as something uh, that, that we can see as uh, representing local culture and apply that in, in a way that you both um, yeah, achieve a contemporary, uh, very much a contemporary identity, but also uh, responding to some local, um, some local issues. Now, um, maybe a final question, and then I would like to um, open it also up uh, to discussion and hopefully get some questions for you. Um, because, as I said, we want to embrace still all the scales and all the typologies. So how can we also, on a smaller scale, be uh, vibrant, effective, engaged people? Um, here are some examples of uh, what we have done with that in the past. Um, pavilions are often a wonderful way to um, put in place on the map and to experiment, for us to experiment with that, uh, with, with, with effects also of engaging people. Um, what I said about what we want to do in that very, very big project in uh, Hangzhou, where we try to, where we position these towers in a twisting way opposite each other, here in that very small scale, this is what we try to do. We want to engage people, uh, capture their attention, uh, make an environment that, that people can uh, respond to and that they can appropriate and use in different ways. Um, in a very recent installation in uh, China, for instance, also it is an, um, a, a long object that, um, that, that just marks the place as sort of gives it identity, but also um, I think in a, in a contemporary way allows people to um, interact with it. And um, ultimately that is um, yeah, our, um, our main wish to make spaces that um, yeah, can, uh, can really contribute to um, quality of life for people. Thank you very much. <laughs>